please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our guest this evening, Zachary First. Thank you. Good evening. Please feel free to raise your hand and stop me at any point. Um, as much as we can, I hope we'll be able to have a conversation here. Um, so anything that strikes you as uh, I'm telling you the story I'm about to tell, please don't hesitate uh, to let me know. I should say, uh, by way of background, because I'm here at a business school, School of Management, um, that Drucker is widely regarded as the father of modern management, um, but he was not himself a management fan. Um, it's an interesting thing that I think we can tend to lose sight of. The field didn't exist, properly speaking, when he first started writing about it. So there was nothing to be a fan of. He hadn't yet created it. What Drucker was, was a fan of society, humanity. And in particular, he was born in Austria, raised in Vienna, went to graduate school in Germany, all in the 1920s and 30s. And he witnessed firsthand the rise of the National Socialist Party, the Nazis, they actually banned and burned two of his earliest writings. We still have an original copy of one in the Drucker archives with the Nazi stamps on it. And for Drucker, when he fled in 1933 initially to London, management became for him the focus of his life's work because he saw it as the single most powerful tool for ensuring the strength of society. The alternative to tyranny, he said, is performing effective management. So the reason that we do what we do at the Drucker Institute, which is a social enterprise based at Claremont Graduate University, uh, is because we are actually trying to help save society from a repeat of what Drucker himself lived through and saw. So I'm a big fan of management. I love it. I'm a big fan of organizations. I love them too. What I really care about is what we're trying to get all of our organizations to do in concert with each other, and that is to lead to a healthy and functioning society. We're not utopians, but we want things to be healthy and functioning. That's why we do what we do. Um, and uh, as you all know, I'm here today to talk to you about uh, a project we've been working on for uh, almost five years now that finally saw the light of day this past December, and that is our company ranking system. We have three expressions of this work, of the underlying research. One of them uh, is the Management Top 250 that runs annually in the Wall Street Journal, ran uh, December early December this past year. A consulting service that we run uh, called Drucker Forward, which is for the companies that we rate. And we'll talk a little bit more about who those are, the companies we cover and rate. We consult with their senior executives to help them make the most of our data and research. And forthcoming, a Drucker Institute fund, an investment product that'll let people put their money behind the companies that we recognize as being well-managed. And for us as an organization, this is a three-part strategy that's quite intentional. The first part is about being public in the, about being present in the public conversation. We got into this research years ago when there was no guarantee of success because we became deeply concerned about the extent to which the public conversation about corporate excellence, particularly corporate excellence for companies that are publicly traded, was largely geared around short-term financial metrics. And for us, that is a deep concern because it speaks exactly to one of Drucker's concerns, which is that's an awfully thin barrier um, against which to lean if you're trying to help shore up the strength of society. So we wanted to get an oar in the water and help move the giant uh, tanker ship of society a little more toward long-termism than short-termism, a little more toward humanistic management than purely financial management, and toward a holistic perspective rather than one that is siloed in the different functional areas of the company. Short-term results matter. Money matters. We're not here to say either of those things don't but they're small parts, we believe, of a larger puzzle. So the first piece of this is being pub present in the public conversation. We want people to know what our principles are and how the system works and be able to have a different kind of conversation about corporate excellence. The second piece is about making our data effective. We want to work with executives to help them apply it and actually do things that are different with the insights we have. And the third piece is about ensuring that there is some real force behind our research. Because one of the things we hear again and again from executives is, no matter how sweet a song you sing, if you cannot demonstrate that capital is flowing in response to your principles, you're going to have a hard time getting anybody's attention. It's just a material reality of running a publicly traded company. So we got to be in that space as well. So I want to talk about, in some sense, uh, the current conventional wisdom about how to understand corporate performance. 
and management, generally speaking, in these large publicly traded companies. I'm going to look at a, um, it's not quite a hometown hero here, but it's a hometown company, Equifax. This is one of the uh, large credit rating agencies. And uh, as those of you who uh, were following the news last September may remember, Equifax was responsible for one of the largest data breaches in U.S. history, covering, by some estimates, nearly all financially active American adults. And this data breach, unlike many others, gave away the whole farm, not only names and birth dates, but social security numbers and addresses, pretty much everything you'd need to really wreak havoc with someone's life. Seeking Alpha is a really popular uh, semi-open sourced investment website. You can look at some of their coverage of the data breach. Here are a few things they noted. The data breach could actually be accretive, that means positive, to Equifax's revenues long term. Why? Because when you wreck people's lives, you then create new business opportunities to sell them services that will unwreck their lives. They also noted the market has a short memory. This too shall one day be mostly forgotten and it will be business as usual. So I got curious when I read this, what evidence do we have that the market will be short term in the way that it looks at this problem? So here are a chart of, uh, charts of Equifax's common stock versus the S&P 500 over a five-year span. So this is from January 2013 to 18. You can see for about the first three years on the chart, they track each other pretty closely. Equifax starts to pull away. And then uh, you see, if you're looking on the right screen, right about here where that yellow band is, that's when the data breach became public. Not when it happened, mind you, but when it became public. The width of this band is 90 days. So when we talk about people looking at corporations in terms of their performance quarter to quarter, that is one quarter, and you know what, it was worse than I thought. It took actually less than a quarter for people to decide, actually, Equifax doesn't deserve to go down in the toilet. In fact, let's just rebound, and probably this whole thing is going to be accretive to their revenues long term. They're effectively a kind of legislatively protected monopoly, so there's some insurance that their income is going to continue to look pretty good. But I just thought, uh, how depressing is that? Um, so we have a different approach. Let's take a look at how we look at Equifax based on pre-data breach data. So this is not data we gathered after the breach, but before. And um, for the one to two of you in the room who have not taken a statistics course, I'm going to quickly review how to read our scores. Um, they are normalized. Uh, and transformed in such a way that uh, 50 is always average on every score that I'm going to show you, and 10 points is always a standard deviation. So a score of 60 is really quite good, not a passing grade on a test, excellent in our system. That means you're in the top 15 to 20%. Likewise, a score of 40, pretty bad. You're in the bottom 15 to 20% if you have a 40. So how's Equifax fare? We measure them on five dimensions, like all the companies we cover. Financial strength, there are 53, so they're slightly above average. Innovation, there are 51, they're almost exactly on average. And we'll get into a little bit what these measures are actually based on. Employee engagement and development, 45, not so good. Customer sat, unsurprisingly, being about the bottom 15%. They don't really have a loving relationship with their customers and social responsibility way down at 35. None of this is particularly surprising in light of what happened, um, but it all was knowable in advance. Add it all up together, and we give them an overall effectiveness score of 41, which puts them again at about the bottom 20%, and on our full ranking of 693 companies, they're number 550. So here's Equifax in summary. We're going to take a little bit of time during uh, the session here this afternoon to look at the uh, financial industry as a whole. So I pulled together data from across all the companies that are in financial services that we cover, um, and we're going to look at them in some detail. Here's how they look as an industry, finance as an industry. Again, 50s average on our uh, whole population. So you see, as an industry, finance is just a tick below average on most of our measures, with the exception of employee engagement and development, which is a tick above average. Interesting. We'll get into that in a sec about why that might be. But you can also see Equifax is well below on uh, four out of the six measures that you see here. So what's all this based on? 
It comes from uh, the books, writings, teachings, and principles of Peter Drucker, the father of modern management. Specifically, we have the five areas in our model that you just saw that I put up those scores for based on 15 Drucker principles. These are drawn from his life's work. I'll share a couple of them with you. I'm not going to read you all 15. Customer satisfaction. To satisfy the customer is the mission and purpose of every business. Pretty simple. Employee engagement and development. The enterprise must be able to give its employees a vision and a sense of mission. It must be able to satisfy their desire for a meaningful contribution to their community and society. You see a lot of this kind of stuff being written these days about um, millennials, about your generation entering the workforce. My gosh, this is a generation that's really looking for meaning in the workplace. Drucker wrote these words, I think, more than 50 years ago. Um, there are certain timeless truths in what human beings are looking for in the workplace um, and in the organizations to which they belong. This is one of them, I think. Innovation, I won't read you all this text, but I want to call out one thing in particular because um, it's something that doesn't really get much discussion when we talk about innovation collectively, the royal we. Um, we talk a lot about idea creation and um, intellectual property creation, but if you look at Drucker's first rule of innovation, again here on the right screen, the, the one I'm circling, organized abandonment. He would say that organized planned systematic abandonment of the old is the necessary precondition to innovation. If you want to be an effective innovator, the first thing you have to do is to figure out what you're going to stop doing in order to make room for the new. And too many organizations try to create the new on top of the old. They don't have the resources to properly support it. The old absorbs the new and it never goes anywhere. So it's an important principle for him in the innovation area. And financial strength, just to be clear, um, because I started with that Equifax model, it's not that we think the markets are irrelevant, they just have their place. And Drucker does right, despite its follies, foibles, and fashions, the stock market is a good deal more rational than the experts, at least over any extended period of time. And you see this a lot in the research that shows that, for the most part, um, people who are picking stocks can't, uh, with a very, very few exceptions, can't beat the market over their entire career. So. Um, social responsibility, lastly, I want to talk about just because it's a, um, something that most companies are working on and paying attention to, but we have a very particular view about what it means. Social responsibility doesn't mean simply doing good out in your community. It means, as he says, it's making management's responsibility whatever is genuinely in the public good to turn that into the enterprise's own self-interest. So we don't simply want to be out giving money to worthy charities and replanting trees. We want to actually make money and develop a thriving enterprise based on the serving of needs that are toward the public good. That's really what social responsibility is about. It's integrating a sense of responsibility for society into the core of your business. So a handful of companies at the top of the list. This was one of our questions before we developed the ranking. We know the companies that we think are Drucker-like in a variety of ways. Where do they rank on our list? And if they're low, that's probably bad news for us. Um, the good news is uh, a number of the ones that we really liked before we did this work are also right at the top of the list. Amazon, uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon for his new senior managers gives everyone a copy of The Effective Executive. It's a Drucker book that's 51 years old and still the best book on how to actually get things done, I think. Uh, Alphabet, formerly Google, is up there at number three. Eric Schmidt, who just stepped down about six weeks ago as chairman. Uh, wrote at Google, we think business guru Peter Drucker well understood how to manage the new breed of knowledge workers. After all, he invented the term in 1959. Procter & Gamble, up there at number six. A.G. Laffley is a two-time chairman and CEO, created uh, more than $100 billion in market cap. Drucker's insights are profound and often transformative. Number 14, Intel. Andy Grove, a co-founder and CEO. Drucker spoke in plain language that resonated with ordinary managers. You don't have to be fancy to make a point. Consequently, simple statements from him have influenced untold numbers of daily actions. They did mine over decades. What's the model actually look like? I'm going to fly through this. Um, I promise there will be no equations, but we're going to take a quick look at this. So as I said, we cover uh, close to 700 companies. The way we picked that universe was we needed companies that were publicly traded so we could get sufficient data and disclosures. And we needed them to be big enough that we could get valid samples on things like employee reports of uh, their engagement and development. So we ended up with companies that have a market cap of greater than uh, 10 billion or that are publicly traded in, in the S&P 500 or Fortune 500. 
That's an accurate Venn diagram, by the way. So you can see there's a lot of overlap, but there is a little bit of, uh, a little bit of boundary uh, action happening there in some of these different populations. Add it all up, it's 693 at latest count. It might be 690 after a few mergers and acquisitions. We work with 12 data providers. We are not ourselves a data generator. We're a data consumer and processor. So we work with 12 data providers and 37 individual indicators. Here you see the five areas of the model. You see the number of indicators under the hood of each. It's pretty even. It's either seven or eight for every one of them. Though we note down in the bottom here in the footnote, some of these indicators are themselves composites. So you can find in many cases a single data point might be drawn from hundreds of millions of individual inputs that go into that. Um, and again, all the indicators ladder back to these five larger areas, and those five larger areas all ladder back to the 15 Drucker principles. So we try to be very transparent about this. And if you want to read more, it's all up on our website, drucker.institute. You can find all this stuff, including the methodology documented. Um, so uh, one question we get a lot, um, and I'm not a statistician, so it's taken me a while to uh, be able to answer this in a way that's both straightforward and accurate. Although if you're a statistician, you're in the room, you'll let me know how I do. Um, we get asked this question a lot, how do you weight your model? And the answer is we don't, because we didn't want to come in ahead of time and decide that some things were going to be more important than other things. So what we use is a technique called principal components analysis. And what that does is it lets us let the data tell us how much of the underlying construct we are measuring that each data indicator sees. And the way you can understand this is as if you're taking a panoramic photo of, let's say, a part of the Grand Canyon with your phone, and every time you take a shot, each picture is going to reveal a different view with different amounts of detail and different amounts of perspective. And the principal components analysis technique lets us put those pictures together and, in fact, in many ways, in effect, inquire of the picture, how much of the scene have you captured? And that's where our coefficients come from. So we've not put a thumb on the scale ahead of time. Now let's take a look at what the data actually looks like. This is our visualization of it. If you want to look at a company or an industry at a snapshot in time, you see each of the five uh, areas of the model with a series of spokes arrayed off of it. Each spoke represents a single indicator or variable in the model, and we'll get into what those are in a sec. And this is effectively a radial y-axis. So the farther from the center a spoke is, the higher the value is. The closer to the center one of those dots is, the lower the value is. And you see a slightly bold yellow line in the center of all those concentric circles. That's 50 on our scale, so that's average. And every fine line above or below is five points. So uh, we can look at this data and see where a company is at any given point in time for the data we have. We can then look at a company historically and see how it got there. This is actual client data. You can see here anonymized, but we can see changes over time. And oftentimes we can map important organizational events. The client often will map for us important organizational events onto these changes. And then we can build a causal model and actually see how these different elements interact over time. So we can begin to see what drives change in what. What is responsible for these changes we see over time and to what extent do we expect some of these things to change in the future. That's the basic value proposition for the executives we work with. All this stuff should ladder up to you getting to make smarter choices and get better results, particularly for your internal resource allocations. There's a lot of mystery and voodoo about how to spend money on things like HR and innovation. We're trying to help people get smarter about it. Um, I want to take a quick look at an example that I think will be helpfully illustrative. And it's a question um, that we got very quickly as soon as we shared uh, the advance of our list with the journal and their reporters started working on this, which is, what's so great about tech companies? Seven of the 10 at the top of our list are tech firms. And the conventional wisdom is, well, that's just because they spend so much money on R&D and they have all these smart engineers and um, therefore their innovation scores must be off the charts. And in fact, that turns out to not be true. So I'm going to tell you what does set them apart in just a sec. Um, interestingly, also, you see we got some like what people normally think of as kind of fuddy-duddies at the top along these seven tech firms. We got J&J, &J, Procter & Gamble, and 3M. Kind of old, pretty old, big behemoths. So here is how tech looks relative to everybody else. You remember before I showed you how 
um, Equifax looked relative to the finance industry as a whole. Here's how tech looks. Now, of course, the entire population, the average is always 50 because that's how our scores are normalized. So let's take a look at tech. And the one thing I want to highlight for you is this, again, on the right screen here, this word absolute next to innovation. Innovation is the one area in our model where we relied very heavily on relative, industry relative measures, specifically because we were concerned about the outsize effect of, let's say, measuring a tech firm that spends $10 billion a year on R&D against a wood and paper products firm that excels in innovation and spends $17 million a year on R&D. And we didn't want to penalize in either direction. So what we did was we actually derelativized our innovation measures for the purposes of the constructing this slide because I wanted to know on an absolute basis, is this story true? Tech companies stand out because of innovation. No, it's not. They're a score of 52. I mean, they're modestly better. Where do they really stand out? It's at the top. It's customer satisfaction. Tech firms stand out because their customers like the products and services that they get. That is the differentiator for them. So let's take a deeper look. Who else scores a 56 on customer sat? That's the tech industry average. Dr. Pepper Snapple, Tractor Supply, Reliance Steel and Aluminum, Raytheon, Iron Mountain. You notice a the theme? You don't need to be a tech firm to have a 56 in customer sat. Let's look a layer deeper. Where's the customer sat score come from? Well, social responsibility is actually responsible directly and through second order effects for two thirds of the customer SAT score. So we're gonna dip just for a moment into the causal modeling we've done around this. And it happens through a couple of pathways. And this is extremely stable over time and consistent across the entire population of companies we see. Let's talk about these pathways one by one. Look at the first one, innovation to customer SAT. Why does that work? If you're innovating, you're figuring out new ways to deliver value to your customers that helps them feel satisfied. Employee engagement to innovation, which is a second order effect. Engaged and well-developed employees will tend to do more good work and bring more of their best ideas to work, which will help to power innovation and innovation initiatives and thereby drive innovation, thereby driving customer sat. Now the interesting thing is social responsibility at kind of the head end of this. What's going on with this? Well, Three things. One is customers feel more satisfied when they shop or uh, do business with organizations that have a clear sense of purpose that they can understand and relate to. And we see a lot of that going on today in the press talking about that phenomenon. Employees, as it turns out, also tend to be more engaged and feel uh, better developed as employees if they're working at a company, just like customers, that has a clear sense of purpose and mission about what its role is in the world. And interestingly, one of my favorite connections, just because I think it's um, probably underutilized, is if you have genuinely embraced this view of social opportunity, that you've decided that meeting social needs is core to the business enterprise, that's gonna make you more effective at innovation because it keeps you more closely connected with what the needs are out in the world. You will be better at understanding what people are after these days if you are paying more attention to what you're doing for people. So. If we're interested then, how are tech firms getting this really high customer SAT score? Part of the explanation is about the strong role of social responsibility. And so I wanna know who are the top scorers in social responsibility? Here's our top 10. And yes, five of them are tech firms. But five of them are also very definitely not tech firms. Johnson Johnson. Tech Resources, a Canadian mining company. TD Bank. TELUS, communications, right? So. Here's how we'd sum it up. Tech firms are most effective, not mainly because they're innovative, but because they effectively combine social responsibility, employee engagement and development, and innovation to drive exceptional customer satisfaction and above average financial strength. Now that, to me, is a different and much more interesting finding than tech firms are at the top of your list because they spend a lot on R&D. Um, and it offers some real opportunities for organizations that are not rich in capital and that are not working in traditional tech businesses. So let's take a look at what this looks like um, and the kind of work we do with our clients. This is a visualization of the uh, financial sector. We took all those companies, averaged them together, and then did an indicator level analysis of their data. And we're gonna dive into this now. We call this the dream catcher, so we're gonna dive into the dream catcher. So first, we'll take a look at customer sat. And I'm gonna highlight a couple of findings for you here that I think are interesting, and it's part of what you get from this more holistic view. 
Take a look across the top, the absolute customer sat scores, 53.4, the Temkin index, which is a customer experience and customer service, 53, net promoter absolute, 51. So they're above average. And then look at this thing all the way on the right, the quality gap score at 45, which is not very good. What is that telling us? It's telling us that on average, across all these firms that are in this financial group we bucketed together, customers are simultaneously satisfied, but also being left like things fell a little short. So they're coming in with expectations that are not being met, but the products and services they're getting are satisfactory. That's an interesting problem. If you work in this industry, it's not as simple as we need to give better products and services to our customers. We have an expectations communication question here. Why do consumers expect what they expect of us? How do we better align their expectations with reality so that they feel even more satisfied? Let's take a look at financial strength. One thing I'll highlight here, because as I've been talking with executives who work in this business, they will quickly point out for these measures like operating ROIC, return on assets, return on common equity, they'll say, yeah, 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 of course we're in the 40s because we have all these onerous capital requirements such that we can't actually do all the things with our money that we'd like to do. That may be changing now. Um, but that's one thing they will note. Uh, employee engagement and development. Interesting thing that jumped out at me here. Again, as we look at this granular data, most of this comes from either Glassdoor or Payscale, sites that you all who are shopping for internships or jobs are hopefully on, using as a data source for yourself. Um, you can see that, again, here we are in the financial industry. The pay differential at 48.7. That means that employees are making a little bit less to work in this industry than they could with that same set of skills and resume if they worked in a different industry. So they're leaving some money on the table, which is kind of counter to expectations. Not a lot, 48.7, but they're leaving a little bit on the table. I think it's probably related to the number you see next to it, which is the confidence index. They like the business outlook, and they like the leadership. And so they're willing to trade a little bit in order to get that. Again, if you're working in HR or you're trying to manage change with people, these are really important insights to be able to tease out. Employee engagement is not a monolithic figure, um, and to be able to contextualize this against other companies and populations is really valuable. Social responsibility. Again, here you see slightly below average, um, almost across the board. Um, I'll highlight just a couple of things. One is uh, the, the two measures that are on the right. The shared value index is one, uh, it's the only truly unique metric that we actually commissioned an outside firm to create for us because we needed something that was going to more accurately capture the, that Drucker highest goal of making social needs core to the uh, business enterprise. And that's what that shared value index is. And the last one is a supply chain rating, uh, social responsibility rating, which is a fairly new thing to try to rate not only how companies treat their responsibility in terms of what they directly contact, but how they manage responsibility across the supply chain. Um, and last, innovation. And uh, this is one uh, your dean and I were having a good conversation about the real difficulty of measuring innovation well. It's a huge challenge. And it's a huge challenge particularly for us because our worldview is innovation, properly speaking, should be systematic. It's everybody's job all the time, no matter what you do. You should have innovation, yes, in products and services, yes, knowledge creation and IP creation, but you should have innovation in procedures, in practices, in culture. Innovation is the purview of the front line as well as the executives and the R&D operation. It's everybody's job. Now, how the heck do you measure that? It's really hard, and I am not here to tell you that we have solved that. This is an ongoing R&D project for us. We add new indicators every year. We're working right now on the 2018 indicators. So you can see probably some things that are pretty familiar across the left. Trademark applications, trademark registers, R&D spend. I'll highlight one thing here for you, which is this second from the left, the rate of abandonment. We look not only at how many new inventions companies have received, but the rate at which they are abandoning the patents they already hold. And it's a good sign for us that they are actively pruning their business in order to tune themselves for what's coming. So it's good to see a positive number there. Um, and again, you see a supply chain innovation index as well as a responsibility index. When Drucker worked as a consultant himself, he would end every meeting uh, he had with this challenge to his consulting clients. Don't tell me you had a wonderful meeting with me. Tell me what you're going to do on Monday that's different. 
And uh, we've made that our mantra at the Drucker Institute. What are you going to do on Monday that's different is um, our tagline. And it is also what we organize our work around. I'm a little reluctant to ask you guys to do anything different on Monday because you're in the thick of a lot of stuff right now. I'm not sure you need something else to do. Um, but I will say to you, if there's one thing you can take away from this talk, never mind the pretty pictures and the charts and graphs um, and the interesting words, is to remember that um, until an idea becomes action, until a plan turns into action and results, it remains impotent, just sort of a notion. And I hope that whatever the idea is, whether it's related to everything I've just said over the last half hour or not, you'll walk out of this room with something that you think you can go do on Monday that'll be different and helpful for yourself. That's ultimately what management is about in a lot of ways, orientation toward results and trying to do better. Um, so again, these are the three expressions we have of our work. Um, I would be glad to answer any questions you have about anything you've seen, any of the things we're doing in these three areas, how the journey we were on to get to where we are, um, wherever you're at, whatever area it is you're studying, you want to plumb the depths of that particular area, anything at all, I'd be glad to take questions. We'll have a lot of time for Q&A here so we can have a good conversation. So um, with that, I'll just turn it over to uh, you all. So when it comes to employee engagement, I was wondering, do you consider leader-leader strategies like Agile and Scrum to help with kind of giving motivation to employees, or do you include that in your index at all? Right. Great question. We are fairly agnostic about the specific management mechanisms that people use. Um, our focus in the system is on the outcomes for the employees. And um, on this particular question, I was just having a conversation earlier today, as it happens, about a firm that uh, implemented Agile and Scrum, and everybody was miserable as a result because the implementation wasn't good. So um, what they did was kind of exhort everybody, here's this new system. They produced a whole bunch of documentation and training on how to do it, and then they didn't give their engineers an opportunity to actually work in that way. Projects were still being managed in the same way. And what that means is everybody actually got less satisfied. They felt disengaged. They felt like I'm being asked to do something and then not being given a chance to do it. It's cognitively dissonant. I don't like working here anymore. I want to get out of here. So, Part of the reason for not emphasizing specific management techniques is pretty much any technique can be done well or poorly. And what we want to focus on is what's the outcome? What do you get for what you've done? Um, and so in that sense, it'd be interesting to see if you know companies that are particularly good at Agile and Scrum that have really embraced that. You could look at our ranking, which is up on our site. And we've published the five subscores as well for all the companies we scored. The journal just published like star rankings because they wanted it to be readable. But we put all the raw numbers on our site. You could go look and see how do those companies rank. And uh, particularly, what do their employee engagement development scores look like? Probably also, what do their innovation scores look like? You'd want to know. Might be helpful. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Hey. Yes, hi. Um, so you guys use a metric called employee engagement. Yep. Um, and I'm curious how many employees um, Drucker employs themselves. Mm -hmm. We have a team of eight full time. And uh, we have a quasi full time data scientist who's uh, in semi retirement who does all this work for us. He's working nearly full time again on, on this project and has been for a few years. But we're very small. Okay. Um, I guess my second question is you rank about 700 companies. Yep. Um, would it not be fair that you consider yourself in the top 700 in terms of employee engagement? Oh, for ourselves, you mean? Yeah. So we don't actually have, we're, our population of employees, it's a great question, we're not large enough to be able to produce a valid sample in Payscale and Glassdoor um, so that we can be compared apples to apples with the other companies we're ranking. So then the question is, what, how can we embrace this system in the way that we manage ourselves? even if we're only embracing the principles, but we don't have a similar kind of data that can let us be directly comparable. Um, we do a lot. We're pretty relentless internally about trying to bring in outside assessments to help us understand who we are and how we're working. Um, again, the Glassdoor and Payscale ratings would be a little difficult um, because actually at this point I'd be requiring people to fill them out because they haven't already and that's got some real bias that's introduced in that process. But we did just go through, for example, a decision-making bias tool from an outside firm that does, is a really interesting approach. Uh, they're called MetaBias, if you're interested and you want to look into it. It's a startup based out in Southern California um, that does decision-making bias assessments. 
And one of the most important elements of that for me was for me to take it and to reveal my score to the team so that they can see. And in fact, I'll share with you, it turns out, um, I am in the top third of the population distribution for being biased in my decision making. That led to a really interesting conversation on our team about what turns out to be systematic skew in the population of people in leadership positions toward bias. Because actually a lot of what manifests in the world as leadership and the way that we traditionally think about it is biased decision making. It's people who know how to make the call, right? And people who shoot from the gut or the hip, if you're Jack Welch or whatever, which I can't remember which one he was. But <laughs> There are behaviors like that, and if you're too consultative and you ask too many questions and you take too much time to make your decision, we think, yeah, it's not really effective leadership. But that's actually mostly what people who are not biased decision makers, who are intentionally unbiased, do. So one of the things that's valuable about that conversation is it brings to the surface for our team in a quantitative way, who are we as team members? And I got people who are actually also at the other end of the spectrum. They're so unbiased that they can't make a decision, which is the opposite problem. They're always gathering information and they never have enough. So we can take a tool like that and say, even if we can't use this system directly because we're a tiny little social enterprise buried within a much larger employer as a graduate university where we're based, we can't compare ourselves, we can take some of the principles here, which is external rigor, data-driven analysis, combined with a humanistic, holistic orientation, what do we make of how all these parts fit? And we do net promoter and some other stuff, so we try to use some of these same measures but we're just too small. You know, we run on like two and a half million dollars a year, so our R&D budget isn't even really meaningfully separable from our regular overhead. Um, but it's a great question. Uh, for those of you who are doing work in tech, you know this term dog fooding, which means using your own products. We are right in that zone because I spend my time talking to people about managing organizations. I should be practicing everything that I preach because if I'm not, I'm really in trouble. There's just a total lack of integrity if I don't actually do what I tell people I think works. And sometimes it's valuable, you learn, right? You dog food and you discover, hey, that thing looks good on paper, but it's actually not really good in practice. So it's another good reason to do it. Not only so you have integrity, but also so you can learn about your own stuff. Okay, I have a question over here. Yeah. First of all, Monday is spring break at Georgia Tech, so I guarantee you there's a lot of people in this room that's gonna be doing something different on Monday. <laughs> Sleep? Yeah, good, great. But my, but my question is <laughs> this. Uh, you made a statement regarding employee engagement uh, yeah. and the relationship with uh, innovation, and it applied there's a, there's causation. And I'm just curious in terms of whether you're actually able to find causation in your analysis, or are we actually just saying that it's correlated? That? Yes, yeah, correlation versus causation. Um, and in particular, when you're looking at complex social systems, like a large organization, there is never a moment at which you will be able to say with 100% confidence, we are looking at causation. What you have are degrees of confidence with which you can say, this correlated relationship appears to us to be causal for the following reasons. So the first input into that are the principles that we're working from. If we don't see any reason before we've looked at the data why there should be a connection there, you'd be a little suspicious if I came in here and told you, I can't tell you why, but it looks like there's a causal relationship. Um, we came in expecting one. We came in expecting a bunch, actually, and some of them didn't prove out, so that was interesting. Um, but some of them did. And in this case, um, we've used a variety of techniques that we feel pretty good about to say, this appears, oh, we're looking at three-year steps in particular, um, is how we shortened so we could look at several moving averages across, we have a six year back test that we ran. It looks pretty much like a causal relationship. So now what we moved on to is we've engaged a couple of the first outside data scientists who are themselves scholars. We're working with a couple of folks um, on the West Coast who we've given our data to and said, we want you to help us understand what did we see that you see? What do you see that we've missed? How can we get better on this? So, we want to try to help companies be rigorous and smart about leveraging these connections, particularly if they're not using them. And we also have to proceed with an abundance of caution because lots of resources move based on these decisions. And we want to be careful we don't overpromise our certainty. So we see, the one thing we do see with, I'm going to say, as close to 100% confidence as we can get is that the intangibles drive the tangibles. And what that means is financial performance is a result. It is not an input only and ever. Across 700 companies in six years, there is zero statistically significant relationship between your financial strength score and your score on any of the other dimensions. 
No systematic relationship. If what you want to do is drive financial strength, focus on the other four areas. That's basically the bottom line, and we are quite confident in that based on our data. Yeah, thank you, great question. Yeah. So with your data, are you able to separate uh, divisional or departmental trends from the company as a whole? So in some companies, you have very siloed areas where the R&D department could love the company, they focus on innovation, they get all the money they want, but manufacturing is like, this place sucks. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Here's how, here's how I think about our system. Um, we are like your general practitioner as a doctor in a world that is mostly populated by specialists. And so what we can help companies do is um, typically what will happen is we don't drill down to the divisional level. Mostly, in some cases, we have raw data that does. It's not normalized, but we can go back and look at it. Um, but what we can do is typically when those kinds of things are true, you will see discrepancies across some of the indicators we have. Normally, you'd expect to see strength next to strength, and instead you see strength next to weakness in the same area. And like when you go to your doctor, it's a chance to say, your lower back may hurt, but the problem is probably in your knee. Now, beyond that, you don't want me performing your knee replacement. What you want at that point, hopefully, is a skilled and talented and knowledgeable internal HR operation that has a rich trove of data, and we can help them figure out where to look and why. So we have to work together with executives. That's part of why we set up this consulting service. It's not only to make money. It's because we want to make sure people are using this information and using it responsibly, because um, we also don't want this to just be a cudgel that comes down on someone's head and says, why is your score so crappy, and then we want to make them feel bad. Um, that that's not the goal of this either. So you do still need all the employee engagement surveys and the stuff that every large organization does. That data is really important. Um, we're hoping to just help people get a better handle on where to look and why when they're trying to be diagnostic. Yeah, was there, do I remember a question? Oh, yeah. Got, okay, great. Over here, yep. So this may be um, a little bit related to this question, and thank you for coming today. But um, you know, when you're looking at large corporations like this, and I'm curious for Drucker Forward and the consulting component of it, when you're going in there, how are you moving things forward? I mean, a lot of the times there's a lot of different levels of management where the principles that need to be changed, I mean, th that's large scale change management. How detailed are you getting in that with them? Yeah, um, it's a timely question. I was just meeting earlier today with a firm we're looking at doing some work with whose specialty is internal communications for change. That's not our specialty. I, of course, like everybody else, have strong opinions, but I, but I don't actually have any talent in that area. So um, what we aim to do is to get in and out in the minimum amount of time so that we can get out of the way, and then to try to leave executives well-informed and positioned to either be able to run those initiatives themselves or to help them understand, like the firm I was talking to earlier today, who can you work with who can help you with this problem? Um, so an engagement for us, a consulting engagement for us, is a day or less. We do a bunch of research and prepare reports and visualizations and stuff ahead of time, and then I'll spend from anywhere from two to eight hours with an executive team to help them go through this, understand how all the pieces fit together, understand how they relate to the strategy the company is trying to pursue and identify the priority areas and why those are the priority areas. At which point that team is either confident, oh yeah, we know how to do that stuff, or they're going to say, okay, now we need help in a different way, which is how do we get everybody, you know, like this problem with Scrum and Agile. Yeah, we actually did a great job on everything but giving them real work opportunities. How do we redesign our projects? We don't know how to do that, so we've got to be able quickly too, to have a network of other consultancies or outside experts we can refer in so that we don't leave people like, needing help and not having it, for sure. Right? We have to know what we know and know what we don't. And mostly, we don't know anything. We know a few things. So. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Hi, thank you for being here. I'm curious, what response, if any, has there been from the investment community with respect to your rankings, and have you also seen any direct corollary trends between how you assess the data and the market's response? Yeah, um, great question. Uh, lots of interest for a couple of reasons. Um, one, they like the name. It's hard to stand out in the investment world, particularly in um, the fund world, of, like exchange-traded funds and other things that are related. Um, it's hard to stand out. The Drucker name is known and, and respected by and trusted by a lot of people, so that's helpful, so they like that. Two, interestingly, one thing they really like about it is that we didn't set out to create an investment tool. We set out to create a management assessment tool. And they get, 
we've, I've now spent the better part of three years working with a variety of potential partners in the investment space, and every one of them gets nervous the moment they hear a pitch that's something that's designed as an investment tool, because their first concern is that you've goosed it somehow. You've overfit to the model, you've chosen your start and end dates on your comparison period carefully in order to make it look better than it, than it otherwise would be. So the fact that we didn't try to do that is a valuable thing. They all wish, we have a performance edge, it's positive, so if you follow a particular formulation of this, that again, we're hoping to have public later this year, you'll do well. You can actually beat the broader market, we think, by a little bit. Now, you're not going to beat it by a lot, so active management firms are not interested in it then. So they talk in terms of basis points, and if you can't offer 150 or 200 basis points, it's just like they can't make money with the strategy. If you can offer something that is you know, a half or a third of that, you can do well with an exchange-traded fund, so that looks good. Then you know, now you're into a question of where does this belong in an investor's portfolio as a product. So now if we try to look out as, as a product creator, if we think that this is a good idea for people to put their money into this, and it made me like, really nervous because I have a woman on my team who said, oh man, I got all this money sitting around that I've been waiting to figure out what to do with it. I can't wait to put it in this fund. I mean, there's nothing to give you a sense of discipline more than knowing that the person at the desk next to you is going to invest their livelihood in, in the work. Um, it, it's just very clarifying. Like, let's make sure we get this right. Uh, and in, in that case, the question is, well, wh what kind of tool is this? Is this a social responsibility tool? So I, have, I invest X amount of my money and I want 5% of it to be in a social responsibility fund. Is this a broader market tool? So this actually should be like 30% of my investment. Is it something that's long-term oriented? Yeah, probably, because our data only moves annually. So if you're trying to trade like daily or monthly, this is a terrible tool. This is something you should buy these companies and hold them for five years minimum. So, Getting the story right around that is really where the work is in the investment community, is figuring out how do all those parts fit together, and then how do we get some seed capital to get the fund going. Um, so they're interested, yeah, for sure, and, and we're deepened into that work. Um, but like anything, as I was talking with your dean earlier, like anything that is worth doing, it's hard. Um, and I shared with her, you know, one of the top management thinkers in the world today who's a um, kind of a friend of our organization and someone we look to for advice from time to time, said to us five years ago when we were first getting started on this project, oh, it's a million dollar idea, but you'll never do it. So, um, yeah, look, I mean, you run into that stuff all the time. You know, it, this didn't look obvious or smart when we first started. It was just something we were passionate about. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, one of the things that you said is that the financial performance is kind of the output of the management. So how do you guys explain companies such as Equifax, which rank above average in their financial position rather than ranking low in everything else? And kind of to add on to that, have you seen any effects where uh, because they've ranked low in all the other input or the other scores that their financial uh, rankings dip as well? Yeah, great question. And it's in the nature of the normal distribution that there are always going to be outliers. And there are stories behind every one of those outliers. So Equifax, a great question. Well, okay, got the message. Financial performance is the result, not the input. Why is that their highest score? They're basically a protected monopoly. So they're going to make money almost no matter how badly they run their business. Um, and because of that positioning, their score gets boosted. So in essence, what I could tell you is the intangibles in our model explain about 50% of a firm's financial performance, which means about the remaining half is explained by other things, macroeconomic factors. We don't look at foreign currency exchange rates. We don't look at the price of oil. We don't, I mean, right, we don't look at these sort of legislative regimes that they operate under. There's a lot of other factors that explain performance in that way. And similarly, you can also go in, and I haven't done this specifically, but it'd be interesting to do. You could go in and find firms that have really great scores across the board and a terrible financial performance score, and you'd probably find something similar. There was a macroeconomic environment that was really unfavorable to them. And sometimes you just get unlucky. You can do all the right things and get a bad result. So that also happens from time to time. Um, and it's part of why we try to take the long view on this, and we don't update these numbers more than annually, because there's a lot of failure that goes into every success. And if you look too, too closely, you'll get obsessed by all those failures. 
and you'll miss the larger picture, I think. We've got time for one or two more, probably. Over here. Are these rankings uh, available to anyone to, to, for example, if I want to look up the ranking of any particular company, uh, yes. can I find that information somewhere? Yes, you can. Thank you. So um, one of the best pieces of advice we got late in the game before um, we were getting ready to publish, but while we still had time, was be as transparent as possible. The world is full of rankings. The world is full of quantitative assessments of all kinds of things. The hardest thing to achieve is trust. That's the heart, I mean, that's the sole thing that is very hard to find. So the more transparent we are, the more people can inspect for themselves what our system is made of and decide for themselves whether or not they trust it. So we made the decision to publish on our website, Drucker.Institute, and you go there and there's like a big button right on the homepage, you know, see your company through a whole new lens, look closer, hit that button, that takes you to the landing page, you'll see the full ranking of all 693 companies. We published their overall effectiveness scores, we published all five of their subscores. We also published like a 2,000 word methodology write-up that gets into the actual statistical methodology for those of you who are interested. We published a table of all our data providers. We named all the data providers, which variables they provide, how those figures are gathered. All 15 of the Drucker principles are online. So everything you need for the most part to understand whether or not you like this system and how a company fares on it is up on our website. And then for those of you who are really interested and want to go deeper, we have kind of a technical white paper that's available and you can just email me. Um, and we can share that with you too. It goes kind of a next level down in the methodology. I think we had one more question over here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I see in the bio and heard your introduction, you have a philosophy degree. I do. Um, is that one thing that drew you to Drucker? And are there other philosophy majors at Drucker? Uh, do you know all of them. A great, a great question. I wish I had a really smart answer for you about why I picked philosophy as my undergraduate major. The reason is that it was hard and I thought that was kind of neat. Um, and then it turned out I also wasn't very good at it because it was really hard. So um, I came to appreciate it a lot more actually after college was over and I started to understand all the things I was learning were really in a lot of ways meant for adults who were going through all the trials and tribulations of life and there were all these interesting insights about what they meant. So um, the degree has really stayed with me. And it was probably in part what got me into education. And education, an interest in higher education, is what got me into studying colleges and universities as organizations, which is what my graduate degrees are in from the ed school at Harvard. And because I was studying organizational leadership and college presidents in particular, I wound up reading a lot of management literature, not because I was into management, because I was trying to understand leaders. And then I got the job at the Drucker Institute because I was looking for a job on a college campus in the Los Angeles area. Um, and that happened to be open and it sounded like a really interesting entrepreneurial assignment. And it all makes really good sense in retrospect and zero sense in prospect. I would never recommend that path to you. But I will say intellectual diversity I think is a strength of our team. So we have on our team, me, my background is in education and philosophy. We have a career journalist. Um, we have a geologist. We have an uh, environmental scientist. We have a historian. Um, the combination of those disciplines is really, really important to the ability of our organization to see the world in multiple ways and have a rich perspective on these tough questions we're trying to wrestle. Um, so I am, it's probably fortunately, I'm the only philosopher on staff. Um, but, that, but yeah, we have quite a diversity of people. All right, I know you guys all have stuff to get off to at 5.30, so thank you for your time. I know how busy you are, I really appreciate it. I'll stick around if you have questions or anything. Thank you. <laughs>